Right guys, welcome back to some more A-level psychology. This is schizophrenia lesson three and we're going to be looking at biological treatments for schizophrenia. We'll start with the outline bits and then we'll move on to the evaluation points in the second half. There's also a six mark outline at the end so you can see how it would all come together in an essay style question. If you want to jump to any of these elements of the video, you can use the timestamps in the description below. And before we get started, as always, if you find this video useful, please let me know by hitting the like button. Drugs for the most disturbing forms of psychotic illness are called antipsychotics. All antipsychotics are what's known as dopamine antagonists. Antagonists are chemicals that reduce the action of a neurotransmitter. In this case, antipsychotics reduce the action of dopamine in areas of the brain that are associated with symptoms of schizophrenia. There are two main types of antipsychotic that we're going to talk about and two main types that you need to know about for the A-level syllabus. Those are typical or conventional antipsychotics and atypical antipsychotics. And we are going to start by looking at the typical antipsychotics, given that they were the first generation drugs to be developed. So typical antipsychotics were first developed in the 1950s one of the first of which was called chlorpromazine. Now, you don't necessarily need to remember the name. However, knowing the name of a drug and being able to put the name of a drug into an essay outline or into an exam question of some kind just adds a little bit of detail. So if you're good with detail and if you're good with remembering little facts, then remember the name because, you know, detail is good for exam questions. So, like I said earlier, all antipsychotics act as dopamine antagonists, which means they reduce the action of dopamine. And they do this by binding to the dopamine receptors on the postsynaptic neuron without stimulating them, and thereby preventing the dopamine from binding. Now, I've tried to illustrate that in my very artistic drawing on the screen, where you can see the antipsychotic in orange sitting in the receptor sites and the dopamine in pink not being able to get access. Now according to the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, this antagonist effect normalizes neurotransmission in key areas of the brain, thereby reducing positive symptoms like hallucinations. And it was the discovery of this antagonist effect that led to the development of the dopamine hypothesis which we covered in Biological Explanations for Schizophrenia. And if you can't remember that, I'll link the video to the top of the screen now so you can just go ahead and click on it and refresh your memory. Now, a problem with blocking dopamine receptors in this way is that researchers suggested that around 60 to 70% of receptors in the mesolimbic dopamine pathway have got to be blocked in order for the drugs to be effective. Unfortunately, in order to be able to achieve that, a similar number of dopamine receptors in other areas of the brain also need to be blocked, which can lead to some undesirable side effects. For example, typical antipsychotics can produce something called tardive dyskinesia, which is an involuntary movement of the tongue, face and jaw, as you can see in the picture on the right. This is what's known as an extrapyramidal side effect, because the drugs affect the dopamine pathways in the extrapyramidal areas of the brain, which is responsible for controlling motor activity. Hence, an inability to control the motor activity in tongue, face, and jaw. Now, obviously we'll come back to side effects a little bit later on in the evaluation section, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what could happen and what often does happen with long-term use of typical antipsychotics. Now, as well as having antipsychotic properties, chlorpromazine in particular is also an effective sedative and is therefore often used to calm individuals not only with schizophrenia, but also with other conditions. This is often done when patients are first admitted to hospital and are either very anxious or are potentially in the middle of a psychotic break. Okay, so that was your typical antipsychotics. We'll now move on to your atypical antipsychotics. Now the problem of side effects that we mentioned earlier was addressed in the development of the second generation antipsychotics in the 1960s and 70s, and these were known as atypical antipsychotics. Atypical antipsychotics were designed to maintain the effectiveness of typical antipsychotics, 
whilst reducing the side effects. They work in the same way as typical antipsychotics in that they block dopamine receptors without stimulating them. However, a big difference is that they only temporarily occupy the receptors before disassociating and allowing normal dopamine transmission to occur. The fact that atypical antipsychotics tend to have less extrapyramidal side effects is thought to be a result of this temporary binding to receptors. And you can see two examples of atypical antipsychotics on the screen now, and those are clozapine and risperidone. As well as acting on the dopamine system, atypical antipsychotics also act on the serotonin and glutamate systems. It's thought that this action helps to improve mood and cognitive functions and reduce depression and anxiety in patients. This mood enhancing effect means that they're sometimes prescribed to patients who are at risk of suicide, which is important given that 30 to 50% of people with schizophrenia attempt suicide at some point. This is also important because it suggests that atypical antipsychotics may be useful in the treating of negative symptoms as well as positive symptoms. Okay, so we've got a couple of differences there between atypical and typical antipsychotics. Okay, so that was the outline, nice and short. We're going to move on quite swiftly to the evaluation points. I've got four points for you, and then we'll have a quick look at the six mark outline before finishing up. So, a strength of the impact of drug treatments comes from the large body of evidence to support the idea that both typical and atypical antipsychotics are at least moderately effective in tackling the symptoms of schizophrenia. For example, you've got Thornley et al. from 2003, who reviewed studies comparing the effects of chlorpromazine to a control group, and they found that chlorpromazine was associated with a better overall functioning and reduced symptom severity when compared to the placebo. Equally, Meltzer in 2012 concluded that clozapine is more effective than typical antipsychotics and other atypical antipsychotics, and that it's effective in 30-50% to 50 of treatment-resistant cases where typical antipsychotics have failed. Okay, so that research provides evidence that shows that as far as we can tell, both typical and atypical antipsychotics work in the treatment of schizophrenia, and atypical antipsychotics like clozapine also work in cases of treatment-resistant schizophrenia, all of which is a massive massive strength of drug treatments. However, a counterpoint to that is that Healy in 2012 suggested that there are serious flaws with the evidence for effectiveness. For example, a lot of studies are short-term only, and some successful trials have had their data published multiple times, which exaggerates the size of the evidence base for positive effects, because you're just submitting the same positive effect over and over and over again, even though it's, you know, the same study. Also, because antipsychotics have a powerful calming effect, it's easy to demonstrate that they're having some positive impact on the people experiencing symptoms. But that's not the same as saying that they really reduce the severity of psychosis. It just shows that it calms people down. Okay, so that means that the evidence base for antipsychotic effectiveness is less impressive than it first appears, and it definitely needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. Another limitation of antipsychotic drugs is the likelihood of side effects. Now, we talked about the side effects a little bit earlier. We'll go into a little bit more detail here. So, typical antipsychotics are associated with a range of side effects, including dizziness, agitation, sleepiness, stiff jaw, weight gain, and itchy skin. Long-term use can also result in tardive dyskinesia, which we talked about earlier. The most serious side effect of antipsychotics, particularly typical antipsychotics, is called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is believed to be caused when the drug blocks dopamine action in the hypothalamus. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome res results in high temperature, delirium, coma, and can even be fatal, and estimates of its frequency are as high as just over 2%. Now this means that antipsychotics can do harm as well as good to an individual, and 
anybody who experiences these might avoid the treatments because they don't want to experience the side effects. And that makes the treatment of schizophrenia using antipsychotics ineffective. And this final point is a little bit of a discussion point for you. So, the use of antipsychotics poses a little bit of a moral dilemma. On the one hand, the short-term use of antipsychotics is recommended, and they calm patients distressed by hallucinations and delusions, and that certainly makes people feel better. Additionally, they allow patients to engage with other treatments, like CBT or family therapy, and services such as meeting social workers, which are both undoubtedly positive things. However, on the other hand, it is widely believed that antipsychotics have been used in hospital situations to calm people with schizophrenia and make them easier for staff to work with, almost reducing them to like a zombie state, rather than for the benefit of the people themselves. Okay, so they're effectively arguing that the drug treatment is more for the staff in the hospital than it is for the people with schizophrenia. Okay. Furthermore, drugs can be argued to be dehumanizing because they take away an individual's personal responsibility and also a person's individual control when they may not necessarily have consented to treatment because they may not be in a position to consent to treatment, particularly if they're in a psychotic state. Okay, so something to think about with this is that perhaps the prescription of antipsychotic medication should be reserved for patients experiencing great levels of distress, which might be preventing them from accessing alternative treatments and ultimately progressing with their recovery, rather than drugs being the first step treatment for the majority of patients. Okay, so this point is a fairly chunky point, um, and it is you know, a very detailed point as well. Examiners tend to like discussion points because it shows that you're taking into account different elements of the argument. However, you have to be confident in what it is that you're talking about, okay? So if you don't feel confident and you want to just stick to, you know, the three evaluation points that are kind of your straightforward strength or limitation, then that's absolutely fine. I've said it before, three evaluation points is plenty. The discussion point is for anybody who wants to push and get something in there that might potentially push them up to a level four. Okay. Okay, and then just to finish off, I'm going to show you what a six mark outline could look like for biological treatments for schizophrenia. Okay, I've written it so it's about 175 words long. So slightly longer than 150, which is kind of the minimum that you want to aim for, but definitely still doable in the time frame that you would have to write a six marker. So I've got a nice little introduction. Biological treatments for schizophrenia focus on the use of dopamine antagonists called antipsychotics. Then I go in to talk about the first generation of drugs, which were known as an typical antipsychotics, and that they work by binding to dopamine receptors without stimulating them, which reduces dopamine activity in areas of the brain associated with schizophrenia and reduces the occurrence of positive symptoms. I do a little bit about the whole 60 to 70 percent of receptors need to be blocked, but I don't go into a massive amount of detail. I'm mainly using that as a little segue to the atypical antipsychotics. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the fact that a lot of receptors need to be blocked and that it can lead to unpleasant side effects. I'm not going to go into detail on what those side effects are, but I am going to then jump straight into atypical antipsychotics because atypical anti antipsychotics were designed to limit the side effects that typical antipsychotics produce. Okay, so I then go on and say that they also work by blocking dopamine receptors, but that the difference is, is that they only do so temporarily. Okay, and then I've got in my final paragraph here that they also work on the serotonin and glutamate systems, which means that they're effective in improving mood and cognitive functions. Okay, in my last sentence, I just say that that's important because atypical antipsychotics address negative symptoms as well as positive ones. Okay, so I appreciate that there are things in here that I have left out. 
I haven't talked about the fact that they have a sedation effect, for example, in my typical antipsychotics bit. I haven't gone into detail about what extra pyramidal side effects are, even though I know I did that in the video, but I'm leaving that for the evaluation point because I know I've got a bit coming there, okay? I've also not talked about the fact that atypical antipsychotics are good for people with depression, anxiety, or are suicidal. Again, this is a little bit of extra information that may come in useful for things like application questions or maybe a longer answer question where you only are asked to talk about one type of antipsychotic. But for a six mark outline where you're talking about both of them, you don't need to squeeze everything in. It's just about giving a good account of the biological treatments for schizophrenia. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the video. So I hope it's been useful and I hope it's all made sense. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I'll do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you in the next one.